Welcome back. Here we are again. The main subject of this video is actually going to be the rifles used by the Canadian Rangers, which maybe doesn't sound like much of a topic, but Canada, as you know, is second biggest country on earth. And we, we talked about it a little bit on the last video, depending on what sequence you watch these videos, if, if you watch them at all. Uh, but before we get to those rifles, which are quite interesting, um, I thought I would speak for a couple of minutes just quickly, um, or maybe a little more, about uh, the situation facing Canadian gun owners, just because they're sending me uh, so many letters and emails. And this happened before when New Zealand um, did all kinds of things. And again, I don't pretend to understand all the laws internationally, but New Zealand gun owners, I think, suffered terribly because of an incident. And I wanted to tell you right off the bat that it's usually an incident that causes um, government reaction. I, one of my favorite countries to visit is Australia, a fantastic place. If you ever a chance to go there, go there. And while I was there, uh, somebody was attacked by a shark or something. I was busy um, involved in oil and gas exploration in the Northern Territory, which you could check up on. And um, uh, something happened with a shark. And, 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 the, and the next thing was, um, you know, get all the sharks. And then somebody else on another visit, because I've been there a few times, was injured or something went wrong with a saltwater crocodile. And right after that, get all the saltwater crocodiles. But the government there is pretty savvy and they actually responded the way governments should respond to this kind of thing. And that is, well, an incident happened. So we're all probably disqualified from thinking about this kind of thing in that moment. Let's wait a year or two. And instead of going after all the sharks or the saltwater crocodiles or the firearms or all the coyotes or whatever it is, or bears um, in North America, uh, we should just, you know, wait till we're level headed. And I understand it's not easy, especially for the people who have suffered losses from situations like this. But truly, if you were a judge, you would Disqualify, your, disqualify yourself from commenting or thinking about something that that's affected you so personally. You should step back, have nothing to say on the issue, whether it's firearms or crocodiles, and um, let leveler heads prevail. You know, it's a famous saying, the barn doors are always closed after the horses are gone, and that's usually what happens. Anyhow, regarding the laws which are supposedly proposed in Canada. But again, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm getting so much information from so many different sources. And um, it's, you know, sometimes I'm reading this stuff at one or two in the morning. So and then I look for actual accurate information and it's hard for me to find. But here's here's a rifle. This is a falling block rifle. Yeah, I, we've discussed these before. These are well known around the world. This happens to be a Dakota uh, rifle, but uh, the reason I took it out is it's supposed to represent a Ruger number one. And here's how these firearms work for all of the people that maybe don't know. By the way, I did try to approach people, um, you know, in authority positions, but they're not interested in submissions from people like me, which is fine. So at least I can talk about it with you. So a falling block, you lower the block. And th this is simple to understand for anybody. On the Ruger number one, the block is a little smaller. This is a De Haas Miller action. So you raise the, so you put a cartridge in here and you raise the block. And there, you, now you have one round to fire. Uh, I don't view this as like a great threat to national security or international peace or anything. This is this is a design from, a, let's say, at least 100 years ago. I also 
understand that because of the design, see how the block lowers? I could change the barrel on this and I could probably get it to launch some kind of golf ball or something. And then the trajectory and the foot pounds of energy in the golf ball would be different. It would be significant or something. But is this style of weapon a uh, threat to anybody? I mean, most of the time people don't even buy these. Um, I, I, I actually was all my life one of the biggest advocates of this type of action because it really only gives you one opportunity. Um, after that, reloading is slow. Um, so is this the kind of weapon to, be, to turn into a prohibited weapon? I don't see it, no matter what it's chambered, whether it's chambered for golf balls or baseballs or whatever, or any kind of foot pounds of energy, or they measure energy these days in joules. Uh, it is, it would be senseless to make this a prohibited weapon because this is actually exactly the kind of weapon that you would want people to hunt with. So I'll set aside this. Um, falling block and like I said at the beginning it kind of represents all falling blocks and there are many types of falling blocks uh, many different as you can imagine um, inventors with different ideas so we'll set that aside so I don't know who has a plan to ban uh, Ruger number one rifles but that to me is senseless now the second one my case is a little weaker this is a Weatherby Mark V stock the Weatherby Mark V, um, developed, let's say, by Roy Weatherby, uh, is a sporting rifle. Do you think that this looks like a menacing... Well, I mean, this looks like, to me, a fine piece of furniture. And this is the stock of a Weatherby Mark V. And some of the Weatherby Mark Vs are in cartridges that have a certain profile for hunting. When I say profile, I mean a certain trajectory, certain foot-pounds of energy. And whether or not you agree with hunting, it doesn't matter. Um, that's, that's actually not the point of the whole conversation. It's, do these rifles constitute like a threat to national security or peace? This does not, to me, look like the stock of something menacing. Now, you could replace this stock with a polymer stock with camouflage and all kinds of other stuff, but you still aren't changing the character of the rifle. So I thought I'd show you a Weatherby because maybe you're going to read in the news, whether you're in Helsinki or London or New York, that Canada has banned Weatherby Mark Vs in 460 Weatherby or who knows what caliber they pick. I would go the other way and say, ban whatever you want, but exempt Weatherby rifles in whatever caliber, because these are obviously hunting rifles. And the Ruger number one, I'll set this aside, is a hunting rifle. Uh, what else was, okay, so lots of letters about the Remington 742. Um, also, does this look like, uh, or have you ever seen this in the headlines as some kind of like really catastrophic evil uh, rifle. I've, I've never seen this. You know, I'll turn it around for you. This is a Remington 742 carbine. These have been around a long time. Very popular in Pennsylvania and actually they're popular everywhere where you can um, legally use this kind of rifle. And we actually made a video comparing the Remington 742, which this is. This is the carbine and the Browning uh, BAR, which is another semi-automatic rifle, and most people wrote me, and I'm not making this up, that this is a lousy rifle that jams most of the time. As I wrote you back, I, I've had only good luck with the Remington 742, uh, but I guess a lot of people have a lot of problems with the 742, and I think it has a lot to do with cleaning. But this, in case the viewers don't know, this is not a mil-spec rifle. This, this rifle does not meet military specifications. If you use this rifle in sand, in mud, in water, it's probably not going to work. It's a hunting rifle, and hunters are expected to not be exposed to those kinds of conditions. Uh, 
And the same thing is true. I'll sit down the seven for two. The same thing is true of the falling block rifles. Not that these aren't great rifles and the companies that sell them to hunters tell them they'll work always and never let you down. Yes, they probably that's all true, but not in military circumstances. These are, in a sense, frail mechanisms. But uh, so this one is kind of in a way, it's, it, this is not, these are nas not national security issues or problems um, f for really anybody. And I've never heard of a Ruger number one involved in anything uh, or a Remington 742 or a Weatherby, especially the Weatherby. That would really puzzle me if they passed these laws. And of course, you can pass any law, but gradually the population realizes that you have no idea what you're passing laws about. It's just arbitrary um, laws. It's the, like I said, it looks more like a piece of uh, fine furniture to me. Anyway, I hope you can find some sense in what I'm talking about here. And good luck to all the gun owners in Canada. Um, and now we can actually, hopefully, um, segue into the main subject, which is uh, the remarkable expanse of Canada, and it kind of ties in with the rifles a bit. Uh, the country is just so huge. So 70% of the population lives like within 100 kilometers of the border with the United States. And I did um, listen to you, writers, and I looked up the numbers. So, I mean... The, the Yukon, that's a territory of Canada, has 474,712 square kilometers. Nunavut has 1.9 million square kilometers, and the Northwest Territory has 1.1 million square kilometers. I invite you to punch in a map of Europe or any other country. Essentially, Canada has no population minimal north of the border with the United States. And that territory is secured by the Canadian Rangers. And I'm telling you the truth. There are 5,000 Canadian Rangers who are members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, the theory is that if there is a threat coming um, over the North Pole or from some other place, and these numbers, by the way, if you check uh, online. There are zero people per square kilometer in Nunavut and there are zero people per square kilometer in the Northwest Territories. There's one-tenth of one person per square kilometer in a Yukon. So essentially there are no people. But these 5,000 rangers, um, I guess in their snow machines, have been patrolling the Arctic looking for some signs of invasion but I mean, it's basically uncontrolled territory, even though it falls within the borders of Canada. In case you didn't know, Canada borders, of course, the United States, longest land, land border on Earth. And um, there are some small islands that France owns, that there might be some border there. And then Denmark, but basically, uh, again, a small island. I think it's called Hans Island. Uh, essentially, Canada has no meaningful neighbors except the United States, and it's the second largest country on earth. So what did these Canadian Rangers roam around with? The Lee Enfield. This happens to be a very special Lee Enfield, which we'll talk about another time. Um, and by the way, I am privileged to, to have received a couple of, of uh, messages from Canadian Rangers that, that p patrolled um, in their time with the Lee Enfield. Did they ever run into anything? Well, polar bears and seals and sometimes some false alarms, but this is the rifle of choice. And I also heard from some people in the, the Laplander, um, again, people, they used uh, P17 or P14 Enfields. Forgive me, I just, it's too much to remember. Anyway, the Lee Enfield, is the rifle of choice for a long time and um, you know who can question this rifle uh, 10 shot magazine um, also some people 
wrote me that the government is going to make somehow Lee Enfield's prohibited weapons like threats to national security. I, I, I'm actually baffled by what's happening. Canada is totally different from other countries, like in many ways. There are a lot of things that need to be done here. And anyway, the 303 was the weapon of choice for defending the North. And really, that's kind of a distant early warning system. And I think I told you I was up in Yellowknife. Um, and I th thought that we were taken um, to visit an abandoned distant early warning post. Uh, it's DEW. They call it the Dew Line. And that's how we were told we were visiting. But in the meantime, uh, partly for the channel, I looked up. And I guess we were somewhere else, but there, there was, there were a number of radar stations, and I'm simplifying things, and I'm sure I'm going to hear from military people, usually retired, who will, you know, fill in the gaps, and I appreciate that. But there was an effort to control, um, or at least monitor, what's happening in the Canadian North with these distant early warning stations, which were really radar stations. Speaking bluntly, looking for missiles or other, um, you know, military activity coming over the poles, which is the shortest path from Russia. But this goes back to the Cold War, I hope. Anyway, those stations are all shut down. So we've got, essentially, we've got 5,000 Canadian um, rangers um, patrolling the weakest link in security for North America. So anyway, they had these 303s. And it, the fellow that wrote me said that he prefers the 3 he's still carrying his 303, even though he was issued or could have another rifle. And I'll show you the other rifles. So these have been around since, uh, I guess, 1947. And they, you know, they've used them, but th these rifles never wear out. And you've got a 10 shot magazine. That's important to remember because there's all kinds of talk about magazines but you know i think i think what's happened is and i'm you know off track but i guess urban canada especially eastern canada thinks uh, or at least the government thinks there that it can like it has an idea of the rest of the country but the place is just so vast that they have no idea so the laws that they're considering maybe maybe apply for downtown Toronto, but as my friend, I told you about him, um, what was his name? Anyway, uh, I was hunting in Kindersley, Saskatchewan, and it's, um, there, there's nobody around. If you, he, he told me if, you, if I didn't want to see somebody for a week, I, I wouldn't have to see anybody for a week. Um, Dennis was his name, and um, I mean, the North is even more so. Actually, in the north, even if you wanted to see somebody in a week, you may not be able to. And yet the same laws are supposed to be relevant in, the, in that environment as they are in some overcrowded urban nightmare. And I'm not saying that any place is an urban nightmare, but that's kind of how it seems. Anyway, getting back to the guy who was talking about the 303, and he prefers the 303. So this is the... Government of Canada replacement for the uh, Enfield. And of course you know this, or maybe you don't know this rifle, uh, T3X. Um, there was an earlier version. Uh, what do I like about this rifle? Well, it's 308, so that's great because the 303, of course, is 303 British. Um, this one is in 6.5 Creedmoor. This is from our good friends at Reliable. I needed to show you this rifle um, and it has a you know quick magazine release and it has a H and K style barrel rear sight the P, you know different people have different expressions right see so you, you just rotate this and you can um, you know hit at different distances it's an excellent sight I didn't do anything with this particular rifle and the issue rifle would be in 7.62 NATO uh, what do I like about it? Well, the, the, first of all, the iron sights are excellent. Of course, it has a Picatinny rail, if you want to do something with that. Again, it has the 
excellent removable magazine. I hope we can show you that. So very slick, very easy. The Tika, as you know, is one of the slickest um, actions ever. And I'll flip it around for you. So if you can picture yourself in the middle of nowhere on a snow machine in the ice, um, this is your weapon and front sight is good. Um, I, I actually really like the, the sights. I think every rifle should have sights like this. And um, I, you know, I haven't been in close communication, but in the end, if you're in the worst conditions, either the, the um, Trijicon fails or the batteries wear out or whatever, or something gets smashed and um, the metallic sights are what will save you. That'll, that'll keep going. Um, I can see we're trying to film everything. Uh, it's got kind of a, uh, you know, a bright laminate stock. And I did, I did get a picture, uh, which I'm not sure if I'm supposed to show the picture, so I don't show the picture, but um, the Canadian Rangers are, you know, in quite bright, um, let's say, uniforms or, or attire. And they've got these rifles. They, they definitely stand out in the, you know, snowy environment up, up there. And then I'll flip it around again. And I thought, in case you're wondering, I don't think I can balance this. Uh, but this is, I'm assuming this Canadian, this met at least Canadian mail spec. Um, very, you know, excellent rifle. I, it, I guess if I were, you know, if I were in charge of the whole program and the fellow that I deal with, the barrel is too heavy. Um, but it offers advantages. So maybe it's not too heavy. Anyway, that's the T3X. And then... For all of you who have probably not seen the T3X, I thought I'll take out my regular Tika. So I bought this, um, it's a regular T3. This one's in 223, very slick action, but I have received some um, inquiries about the difference. So, I mean, there's a loading port difference. The T3X has a slightly larger loading port just because people found it difficult to go into the loading port of the T3. It's very difficult for me to, to do all this stuff, but if that helps you. Anyway, I think I have to set them down now. But here's a cool thing. So this is a T3, loading port difference. You push this button, you take the bolt out, no problem. You take this, this is the military um, a Ranger rifle. Push the same button, take it out. This is in 6.5 Creedmoor, but it could be in 308. And you take the 223 and it fits perfectly and fires. And in case some people are doubters, here's the here's the Canadian Ranger 308 bolt going into the 223, and it works perfectly too. I'm not saying that that means much other than these are essentially the same rifle, which some people wrote me is not true, but it is true. Um, we'll put the Ranger bolt back in. And I guess on that note, that's a lot to digest. I'm not even sure what it all means, but I think that the people who are passing these laws need to think about reactive lawmaking. Is it really, you know, somebody gets hurt by a polar bear, does that mean we go after all polar bears? Somebody gets hurt by a handgun, does that mean we go after all handguns? Or for you good folks in Australia, somebody gets hurt by a saltwater crocodile, does that mean we go after all the crocodiles or all the sharks or all the anything, anywhere? I think maybe take a couple of years pause. The handgun laws in Canada have been around since, I think prohibition, which was another brainstorm don't ban handguns, ban alcohol, or ban marijuana, or ban certain preferences of certain people, or ban certain people and put them like in isolated places. It's the same theme over and over. 
as far as I can tell, never works. Anyhow, um, on a personal note, and just as a gun collector, um, I look forward to buying one of these. Uh, they actually, at Reliable, let me take this for the video, and I didn't have to pay anything. But I've handled it, and aside from that heavy barrel, um, I think you have a perfect hunting rifle. You know, keep your shots within range, and it has to have been tested to some degree. Uh, it can't be just, uh, you know, we're going to go with the orange rifle, I hope. Uh, this is, this is uh, something else. And there were other competitors, by the way. I did see a um, rifle submitted by CZ and maybe a couple of others. Okay, well, as always, thank you for listening to my <laughs> endless chatter. And I hope that makes some kind of sense to some of you. And what will we close off? I think we'll close off with this weather restock because that was the most... I mean, the Ruger number one is bad. To even talk about that as a prohibited or evil weapon, that's pretty weird. Um, but the Weatherby, it's entirely a hunting rifle and it doesn't matter what you chamber it for. This is not something, I mean, look at this. This is not something that someone will reach for who has much of anything in mind except for hunting. And in the 460 Weatherby, uh, most of you will never fire one, but if you do, um, firing one round is an achievement and I probably shouldn't say that because there are guys who love recoil but it, it, the, it's almost um, unmanageable anyway that's it for today thank you very much for watching and being part of this I would say very unusual channel but um, I learned from making these videos and hopefully you learn from watching them take care until next time we meet see you